Hello, hope you'll join Richard and me for the start of our new evening show. It's got everything from the world of entertainment to the stories and stars behind the headlines. The Richard and Judy Show, soon on Granada. Now on Granada, we join Alistair Stewart and Trevor MacDonald at IDN for the News at 10. over Sarajevo airport, more troops will keep it flying. Algeria's president shot down by a machine gun assassin. Major turns Thatcher's words against her in the battle over Europe. The kidnap of Down syndrome Joe, a man is charged. And a match too far for Jeremy Bates, out in five sets. Good evening. Sarajevo airport in Bosnia, besieged by Serb forces for almost three months, reopened tonight to flights carrying humanitarian aid. A French plane has already arrived. The UN flag now flies there. Just a short time before it was unfurled, Serb forces withdrew from the airport to areas they hold in the suburbs. The withdrawal coincided with the decision by the United Nations to send a further thousand troops to Sarajevo. A small force of UN peacekeepers will hold the airport until the extra troops, mainly Canadians, arrive there from Croatia in the morning. The United Nations flag was flying over Sarajevo airport this morning, but so too were the colours under which the Serbian forces fight, and Serbian armour was deployed alongside the UN's armoured personnel carriers. A damaged helicopter left behind by yesterday's French visitors stands as a memorial to the battle which brought the Serbs back here. They say that as soon as they began to withdraw yesterday afternoon, Bosnian territorials from the suburbs around the airport started moving in. One reason for Serbian nerves about who controls the airport, the runway serves as a link between Serb-controlled areas, one they don't want to lose. And this afternoon, little more than two hours before relief planes were due to land, they were still returning fire against Bosnian territorials around the airport. But in the end, the UN negotiations bore fruit, the Serbs began packing for their departure, though these soldiers are following the instructions of their political leaders with great reluctance. You'll we'll be happy when you're back here again. Today is not happy. I think any Serbian soldier is not happy. But we are back here next week, maybe. And not until late afternoon did the convoy of Serbian armor roll out to leave. General Mackenzie escorting the Serbian leader Nikola Koljovic to the waiting armoured personnel carrier. And we, from Serbian side, certainly appreciate, and I hope that the other side appreciates as much as we do. Finally, the long convoy crossed the no-man's land of the runway. Bosnian-controlled territory on both sides of the route the Serbs had to take to their barracks. An encouraging sign that this agreement may stick. These were the first Serbian vehicles to make this journey without drawing fire. The UN force now in control of the airport is only some 30 strong, nowhere near enough men to make the airport secure in military terms. Until reinforcements arrive, the UN troops here must trust that both Bosnian territorials and Serb troops will keep the promises they've made. Our responsibility is merely to defend ourselves. We have a very small number of people here. We are not capable of defending the airport. We couldn't even defend these buildings here. A very, very modest presence, that's all we have but we have a presence and therefore we are assuming based on the faith shown by both sides that that is sufficient. There's risk involved here. It's worth the risk to do something positive. It was later than they'd hoped, but before darkness fell, they were able to raise the UN flag, their presence no longer challenged by Serbian forces. The United Nations have been trying to achieve this for weeks and it is a big step forward. It does not, however, mean that the conflict here is over. Edward Sturton, News at 10, Sarajevo. The UN warned tonight that it's prepared to authorize international military action if its peacekeeping forces attacked in Bosnia. The Secretary General, Mr. Buchos Ghali, said the UN's aim in deploying a further 1,000 troops was to deliver humanitarian aid as quickly and as safely as possible. Well, those in favor of the draft resolution... The vote was unanimous, the Security Council ordering Canadian troops in and refusing to rule out the use of force if they're attacked. The troops' mission is to open Sarajevo airport and get relief supplies to the city. How is another matter. Arrangement for the operation of the airport and for the reception and distribution of any humanitarian supplies that may be flown in 
are not yet complete. There is concern here. Sarajevo ceasefires don't last, so the UN has decided to go in, gunfire or not. Well, if it isn't sporadic, that's OK. The 1,000 extra UN troops will arrive from Croatia, with Russian, French and Egyptian soldiers replacing them. But no one has spelt out how long the force will be in Sarajevo or how they're to be protected. President Bush, who spent the weekend consulting with allies on Yugoslavia, is keeping an open mind. I'm not ruling anything in or out. I've said that before, and I don't do business that way. We, we work in concert with our allies. U.S. troops in Germany have amassed tons of food, blankets and medicine, which would be flown in on huge transport planes. They did this for the Kurds, but then U.S. fighter planes had control of the skies. Sarajevo has drawn the world into conflict before. With the U.S., Britain and others reluctant to commit ground troops, no one underestimates the risks. But no one at the U.N. is spelling out how long today's vote commits the world to become involved in Sarajevo's plight. The dangers for the United Nations troops and reputation are all too obvious. Further failure in Yugoslavia and the UN risks being seen as a League of Nations powerless to impose peace and order on the new Europe, much less the new world. Bill Neely, News at 10, New York. A short time ago I got an update from our correspondent Edward Sturton in Sarajevo. I asked him first, with the UN troops holding the airport, how safe was it now? Well, the arrival of the humanitarian plane, the first flight in, is obviously intended to capitalise on the momentum created by President Mitron's visit here yesterday, and on the fact that for that critical period when the Serbian troops were withdrawing across nowhere, no man's land, um, there was no firing from the Bosnian territorials. The agreement did seem to stick. That said, I have to say that our car was hit by sniper fire on the way back from the airport, and we were travelling with the UN convoy, so that small group of blue helmets at the airport tonight can't in and of itself guarantee the safety of the airport. Doesn't all go too well then for a more general lifting of the siege of Sarajevo? Absolutely not. The Serbs have, after all, not promised that they will stop attacking military targets in the city. They merely promised that they'll stop attacking civilian targets and that they'll concentrate their weapons for UN monitoring. And indeed, earlier on this evening, there's been firing in other parts of the, sh of the city, mach machine gun firing, and indeed shelling. The Canadians are coming too in battalion strength. What will they find? What will they be able to achieve? Well, they'll find themselves in a very difficult military situation because all the areas around the airport are, are, are Bosnian control, the villages across the runway. The Serbs, on the other hand, have positions just beyond the airport and the, 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 the standoff between the two sides does make it a very, very tense place indeed. Both sides would like it. The Serbians were extremely nervous about leaving it because they believed the Bosnians would come in and take it. So I think that the Canadian force will find themselves surrounded by troops of different kinds on both sides with the possibility that the situation could flare up at any moment. Edward, thank you very much indeed. Algeria's head of state, Mohamed Bouriev, was assassinated today, less than six months after he returned to the country from 27 years in exile. He was 73 and had presided over a crackdown of Algeria's Islamic fundamentalists. Mr. Bouriev's assassin, who was said to have been wearing a police uniform, was arrested. Penny Marshall at ITN reports. Just moments before his assassination, uh, Mohamed Bouriev was smiling. Then he heard gunfire and, startled, looked to his left. His audience dived for cover as the gunman fired a submachine gun into Budiev's back and head and straight at them. Two hand grenades also exploded. The camera turned over in the panic, the sound not recording. Thirty were injured in the hail of bullets, including two members of the government. Budiev was killed instantly. His death plunging Algeria further into political turmoil. The assassin was arrested at the scene by Budiev's bodyguards as more gunfire rang out. No one yet knows who was behind the attack, but it's suspected it was the work of Islamic fundamentalists. Budiev was brought back from exile just six months ago by the forces which have run Algeria since independence. It was their last-ditch attempt to hold on to power and keep the Islamic fundamentalists out. 
fundamentalists who won overwhelming support in free elections last January. But since then, the government has used troops and police to beat them back, cancelling further elections and driving hardline Muslim leaders underground. Boudiaf's death is certain to intensify the political struggle in Algeria and may well spill over into neighbouring Muslim countries in North Africa. Here, the Prime Minister reported back to MPs today on the EC summit in Lisbon and answered his predecessor, Lady Thatcher's call for a referendum on the Maastricht Treaty. Quoting her, quoting former Labour leader Clement Attlee, he said, the referendum was a device of demagogues and dictators. Mr Major said if Britain was to stay in the EC, as it should, it should be at the centre, determining which way it went. After denouncing the Maastricht Treaty again yesterday, a treaty too far, and after calling again for a referendum on it, and after promising to vote against it anyway, Lady Thatcher kept her peace today. Others, including the Prime Minister, did not. It has traditionally been the position of the Conservative Party that we do not accept referenda. That was our position when my right honourable and noble friend led the Conservatives into the lobby in 1975, upon which occasion I recall she quoted Lord Attlee's view of referendum as a device of demagogues and dictators. On the question... Mr Major did not lack for political support in his increasingly angry swipes at his predecessor. Later he denounced those few people for whom Maastricht was the stuff of nightmares. From the Liberal Democrat benches, Sir David Steele talked about Lady Thatcher's near hysterical remarks. Tory backbencher Robert Adley spoke slightly ahead of time about a cacophony of inconsistency emerging from the Lords. And Labour MP Dennis Canavan suggested the former Prime Minister should be sent on permanent duty as Governor of the Falkland Islands. But today's statement was also Mr Major's chance to beat his Lisbon drum. It had been a success, he said, because plans for an increase in the community budget had been put off, at least for the time being. Work would now start on bringing in new members, and others, notably France and Germany, had also wanted a less intrusive community. Oh yes, said one of the Tory Maastricht Treaty haters today, well what about all its fixed exchange rates and common currency and economic coming together, convergence? Convergence in its turn demands free movement of people, namely the abolition of all immigration controls within the EEC and also a massive increase in regional and social funds. Yeah, yeah. Well, if my honourable friend believes all that, I can understand why he's so opposed to it. <laughs> but with a slim Commons majority, John Major cannot quite so easily shrug off the threat of possible defeat, and MPs know it. If the Prime Minister lost Maastricht in this House, would he consider resigning? On... We shan't be losing it in this House. What we saw today was the Prime Minister almost openly mocking at his critics be they Tory backbenchers or former Prime Ministers, in an attempt to make their position look ridiculous and thus isolate them. One Cabinet Minister said tonight that he was very heartened by what he'd seen in the House of Commons today. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. A former psychiatric nursing assistant was charged today with kidnapping Joe Ramsden, the young woman with Down syndrome whose body was found in the woods on the Dorset Devon border in March. Dorset police named the man as Michael John Fox, aged 48. He faces other charges of kidnap and rape. Police discovered the body of 21-year-old Joe Ramsden in this dense woodland 12 months after she disappeared from her home in Bridport. Joe, who suffered from Down syndrome and had a mental age of 10, was well known in her local community. She'd gone missing from her regular trip to look after children at a playgroup in Bridport's leisure centre. Hundreds of townspeople joined police in their search of surrounding countryside. For months, her parents, who run a gift shop in the town, clung to the hope that she was still alive. Earlier this month, they were joined by her school friends, representatives of Dorset Police and hundreds of well-wishers for a special service to commemorate her life. Tonight, police revealed that Michael Fox, who comes from a village near Dorchester, faces just one charge relating to Joe Ramsden. I understand the team of detectives working on the Joe Ramsden inquiry had conducted a number of interviews with Michael Fox before today's charges were preferred. Tonight, Dorset police are unable to say whether further charges are likely. Michael Fox will appear before magistrates in Weymouth on July the 14th. Robert Hall, News at 10, Dorset. Many felt South Africa's courtship with a democratic transfer of power to the black majority faltered significantly with the massacre of Boy Patong.
Today the dead were buried and the ANC arm themselves to the teeth. But their leaders plead the violence must end. A report in part two. Plus, Norway says we will hunt the whales again. And Mr and Mrs Bates celebrate early success for son Jeremy, but alas, the form book had the final word. That's in a couple of minutes. Get me detergent and fabric softener. Detergent softener. Don't forget my purse. That's not enough. I'm dead. Bold Ultra, all in one. Cleans. The softener in it. I've got enough. Thanks. But no thanks. You made a good choice. Was it expensive? Actually, it costs less than your two. There. Brilliant. Then we'll be buying your Bold Ultra from now on. Won't you? No matter how life goes With all its joys and woes I never feel in a jam I guess I'm just an amicable man Got no worries financially Got a pension Pensions from Scottish Amicable Just dial 100, ask for free phone Amicable And all will be revealed no wonder I Scottish Amicable. Pensions, life assurance, endowments. Someone's got their eyes on your car. Always leave it secured with your belongings out of sight. I like a bit of a flutter, so I gambled on not having a TV license. I just went down to 400 quid. properly. It will always remain just a piece of technology and you will never fulfill your true potential. But with a little help from Anderson Consulting, your situation can be completely transformed. Then who knows what new horizons will open to you. Boipatong, a township near Johannesburg, today buried 37 of its dead, men, women and children, from the massacre 12 days ago. The ANC Secretary General, Mr Cyril Ramaphosa, demanded the resignation of President F.W. de Klerk. He said Mr de Klerk had admitted that he'd lost control of the police. In the smoky chill of early morning, they came to pay their last respects. The pain runs deep in Boipatong. Emotions uninhibited as families held night-long vigils beside the coffins of the slaughtered. Mama Sebolai and her eldest son had been hacked to death in this room. 15-year-old Paul had seen his mother and brother die as he hid under a bed. The killings which robbed Paul of his family had today left the entire nation in mourning. As they moved the coffin to the nearby stadium, thousands joined the funeral procession. As the 37 caskets were laid side by side, the enormity of Boy Patong's tragedy unfolded. From grandmothers to babies, they'd been indiscriminately hacked down in the violence 
which has claimed over 7,000 lives in the last two and a half years. It was a day as much for politics as prayer, with speakers united in blaming President de Klerk for failing to prevent the killings. He has proved that he is incompetent and useless because he says he cannot control the security forces. The door to negotiations is rapidly closing. We cannot accept endless negotiations. The people want freedom and they want it now and that freedom means the club must go. The club must go! The club must go! The club must go! The grieving is already giving way to a mood of defiance throughout the townships of South Africa. Many now feel that the time for talking is over. Guns were on open show as the funeral cortege moved out. Evidence that the ANC's call for mass action to bring down the government was seen by young radicals as a signal to revive the armed struggle. Gunfire echoed at the graveside, while in the wake of the procession, another body lay shot and burned on the streets, an Inkata supporter killed out of revenge by the mob. As Boy Patong buried its dead, the nation prayed that the horror of this massacre would finally bring an end to the violence. Jeremy Thompson, News at 10, Boy Patong. Britain warned the world's whaling nations today that they would not be allowed to return to the barbaric practices of the past. Agriculture Minister John Gummer told delegates to the International Whaling Commission meeting in Glasgow to be exceptionally cautious before lifting the ban on killing whales but his tough words cut little ice with Norway. It announced it would resume whaling next year. Iceland, Japan and Russia are considering following suit. The Norwegians took their case to the heart of Glasgow today, a whaling boat steaming along the River Clyde and anchoring under the nose of the research vessel Solo, owned by the arch anti-whalers Greenpeace. The Norwegian crew told Greenpeace supporters and others that the whaling ban made it impossible for them to earn a living. While across the city, the Norwegian delegation caused uproar at the Whaling Commission as it defended the decision to resume commercial whaling next year. It is our understanding of what is civilised that uh, no group or countries should impose their set of values and culture on other countries Highly uncivilised behaviour, the view of Agriculture Minister John Gummer, who says whaling is barbaric. How can one take seriously the words of a country uh, if it uh, demands people should obey international agreements in every other area, but when it was inconvenient for itself, decided to break those rules? A dig there from Mr Gummer at the environmental credentials of the Norwegian Prime Minister, one of the original backers of the Rio Earth Summit. Norway says the minke whale, which it hunted until the ban in 1986, is not an endangered species. Estimates of minke whale numbers vary. In Icelandic waters, between 21 and 28,000. In Japanese waters, 225 to 299,000. And in Norwegian waters, 60 to 86,000. But campaigners demonstrating today argue the minke could be hunted close to extinction, like some other whales. Now that Norway has said it'll start whaling again next year, Greenpeace and the other pressure groups will feel they have to step up their campaign. Hugh Pym, News at 10, Glasgow. In Kenya, two Masai Mara game park rangers were cleared today of the murder of the British tourist Julie Ward in 1988. The judge agreed with three court assessors that the evidence against them was too flimsy. However, he said three other men, two reserve employees and a policeman, had lied and knew more about Julie's death than they had told the court. He also accused the Kenyan police of willful bungling. Julie's parents from Suffolk said they're hoping for a new investigation. It's not an obsession, says John Ward, just a fierce determination to bring to justice the men who killed his daughter. Today, after nearly four years of remorseless pressure on the Kenyan authorities and his own private detective work, John and Jan Ward had their day in court. As the two game rangers accused of killing Julie Ward waited to see whether they would hang for murder. Last February, the court visited the scene of the murder, led by Julie's father, who pointed out the gully where her abandoned jeep was found. Accompanying the judge and jury were the two accused, Jonah Maggiore and Peter Kipin, the two game rangers standing trial for her murder. For the wards, it was the most harrowing moment of a three-year battle to bring to justice those who'd killed their daughter. And the assessors ruled that although Julie was murdered, the prosecution failed to prove 
Maggiore and Capine were those who'd raped her and dismembered and burnt her body. This morning in delivering his lengthy verdict, which included strong criticism of the Kenyan police inquiry, Justice Abdullah upheld the assessor's verdict and acquitted the two men. It was what Mr. Ward had feared. As you say, if they are not guilty, then it would mean that whoever did it is still out there and the judge, um, in his summing up, has pointed his finger quite clearly at three other people. It's taken three and a half years for the ward to battle their way through the Kenyan legal system. They've faced their ordeal with both courage and tenacity. Tennis, this year's unseeded British hero Jeremy Bates was finally found wanting in the fourth round by the French ninth seed, but his newfound fans cheered him anyway. Despite having match point at one stage, Bates went down in five sets to the French player Guy Forget. Jeremy Bates lives just around the corner from the centre court. This morning he drove to work in his Porsche for what might have been the highlight of his 10-year singles career. No British player has reached the men's quarter-final since Roger Taylor in 1973. So the flags were out, the photographers were poised, and fiancé Ruth Leach gave moral support from the stands. After five set points against him in the first set, Bates took a tie-break lead. and clinched the set on the next point. In his native Solihull, parents Sam and Marjorie were already celebrating as they watched on TV. Fourth set, match point Bates. And suddenly everything was going wrong. Fifth set, match point Forget. I mean, I am totally disappointed. I mean, uh, you know, I have match point. I mean, uh, match point for the quarterfinals of Wimbledon. That doesn't come by every day. Naturally disappointed, but as long as he did his best, and you can't ask for anything anymore, can you? The main thing is that he gave it a good. Uh, Good going over. But life goes on. Tonight, Bates and partner Joe Dury progress to the third round of the mixed doubles. A short while ago, he went home with his fiancée, the end of what he called a fantastic day. Jeremy Bates had a message for his fellow British tennis players today. Everybody has the ability, he said. We can all do it if we have the self-belief. Tim Hewitt, News at 10, Wimbledon. In other results at Wimbledon today, John McEnroe beat the qualifier Andrei Ochovsky. Goran Ivanisevic beat Ivan Lendl, who retired hurt. In the women's singles, Tefi Graf, Martina Navratilova, Monica Selish, Gabrielle Sabatini and Jennifer Capriati are all through to the quarterfinals. The British Olympic selectors came under fire today for breaking their own rules and giving Daley Thompson a last chance to compete in Barcelona. He's got until July the 10th to reach the qualifying standard. The national decathlon coach, Jim Talbot, threatened to resign. Thompson's rival, Alex Kruger, said Thompson had talked his way in, though he'd done nothing for the sport for four years. Thompson, now 33, was Olympic decathlon champion in 80 and 84. He had no comment for the cameras today as he set off for training. Barcelona would be his fifth Olympics. That at least is a record. Tonight's main news again, Serbian forces have ended their occupation of Sarajevo airport and tonight the United Nations flag is flying there. A thousand Canadian troops are being sent to keep control. Algeria's head of state Mohamed Bouriaf has been assassinated. He presided over the crackdown of Algeria's Islamic fundamentalists. And a man's been charged with the kidnap of Joe Ramsden, the young Down syndrome girl whose body was found in March. Finally, Lady Thatcher had her first record release today, Salute to Democracy, it's called. On it, she declaims excerpts from Abraham Lincoln's speeches, notably his Gettysburg Address of 1863. Three score and 16 weeks ago, she was toppled from her party's leadership, but EMI still said they felt she was the most suitable person to do it. They're talking about a video version. This is a week of new beginnings for the former Prime Minister. Tomorrow, the Lords, and next week, perhaps, the top 20. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The words come from Abraham Lincoln, 
the music from Aaron Copeland, played by the London Black Symphony Orchestra. Hungry. The result, quite unlike anything heard in Westminster before. So we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. Which sounds a phrase Lady Thatcher might employ when she gets to the Lords tomorrow, although she will be expected to be a little less abrasive than in the past. In the Commons, you will shout, that's not true, that sort of thing. Uh, in the Lords, we say, well, I hope the noble Lord opposite won't think it offensive. I venture to suggest he has perhaps a trifle exaggerated. <laughs> She may wish, of course, the change of the Lords. She said to me that she thought it was a bit slow up here and that she would change it. Well, of course, it'd be very interesting if she tries. Although it's unlikely even Lady Thatcher will want to set her speeches to music. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Different at least. That's news at 10 from Trevor and from me. A very good night to you. there well if you're a hay thief or sufferer you probably don't need me to tell you that pollen levels have been high over the last few days and in fact they're going to stay high tomorrow across the bulk of England and Wales and if you're looking for any relief well head north to those lower levels up in Scotland. Tonight we've got showers spreading in from the south and west becoming fairly widespread and heavy throughout tomorrow but uh, in general overnight I think many places will stay dry muggy misty night in store with some fog patches in places as well. Tomorrow morning we start like this, a lot of showers around in the south and southwest. They're going to work their way north throughout the day. Still some rain over the more central parts of Scotland, probably the brightest start today over the far north of Scotland where it should stay dry for much of the day. And as we go into the afternoon, I think those showers are heavy and thunder in some areas, so if you do get stuck under one, it could be quite a heavy downpour. Again, a warm and muggy day, particularly down in the south, but those temperatures quite a bit cooler up in the north once again. Now let's look ahead on Tuesday, there's the summary. Wednesday we've still got fairly widespread showers, across many parts of the country, probably brighter and drier still up in Scotland. And on Thursday, well, dry in many places, but duller down the eastern side of England. And on Friday, generally starting dry and sunny, but rain will work in from the west later on the day. So there we are, a bit of a change for the week ahead. And just to reiterate, tomorrow, pollen levels are high. Good night. Tuesday evening on Granada, and at 7.30, Nature Watch follows Don Merton, the man who's making a last-ditch stand to save some of the world's oldest and most exotic birds. At 8, trouble for one of the bill. Still nothing from Sergeant Boyden, sir. How long has Matthew been off the air? 30 minutes. His radio's dead, sir. A race to the rescue. At 8.30, laughter all the way. I got this taxi to London. <laughs> I said Waterloo, he said the station. I said I'm a bit late for the battle, aren't I? <laughs> Money problems at nine. Fifty pounds a week is neither here nor there. And then there's this Maggie wanting us to spend more money, money we haven't got. At 10.40, a look back at the royal family's involvement in World War II as Peter Williams talks to the royal household about those troubled years. Just some of the highlights for Tuesday evening here on Granada. Now look at Monday in the Northwest from Granada News. Good evening. Thousands of drink driving convictions could be quashed because of a legal loophole discovered by a Merseyside solicitor, and the government may face huge bills for compensation. Road safety campaigners have been angered by the development. Andy Gill reports. The ruling, which could cost the government millions of pounds, centres on a case in which a Liverpool man refused to give a breath test. The solicitor who found the loophole explained it at a news conference today. His client was charged with refusing to give a breath test. 
but it wasn't made clear whether he allegedly refused while driving or attempting to drive his car or while just being in charge of his car. It meant two offences were couched in one charge and that's not allowed in English law. It's remarkably significant. The effect is that the High Court for the first time has said that there are two different offences of refusal. It's estimated more than 100,000 motorists who've been convicted of failing to give a breath test could claim damages and compensation for loss of earnings and dearer insurance. But the ruling has angered people who campaign against drink driving. They say many people who refused to give breath tests did so because they'd been drinking and now their convictions could be quashed and they could get compensation. 11-year-old Sandra Mitchell from Formby was killed when she was hit by a drink driver's car six years ago. Her mother, Caroline Locke, says tests should be compulsory. If these people have put themselves in the position of taking the risk of drinking and driving, I mean, do they deserve to be compensated? The test case doesn't mean that refusing to give a breath test is no longer an offence. Prosecutors only have to reword the charge for it to be valid. The Crown Prosecution Service could petition the law lords against the ruling. It has eight days in which to do that. A teenager and a 12-year-old boy have appeared in court in Blackburn, charged with causing death by reckless driving. Four-year-old Scott Doherty died in Blackburn Royal Infirmary after an accident involving a motorbike on Saturday. The teenager, Gianluca Cavallo, was remanded in custody until the 6th of July, and the 12-year-old boy was bailed to appear before magistrates a week later. 200 jobs are to go to a hosiery factory in the town of Millam in Cumbria. The Elbio factory, the biggest employer in the town, will close in October. Production will be moved to Nottinghamshire and some of the workers affected will be offered jobs there. The factory has been operating in Millam for 30 years. British Airways crews at Manchester Airport have failed to stop the airline setting up a regional company, which they say will cut their wages. The Court of Appeal dismissed an application backed by the Transport and General Workers for an injunction against the airline. A union spokesman said the battle's not over. 200 of the cabin staff plan to take the airline to an industrial tribunal claiming breach of contract. A British Airways spokesman said the court decision was good news for customers and staff. A Wigan company has been fined £3,500 for allowing hundreds of gallons of diesel to escape into a stream. Abram Alloys Limited admitted allowing industrial waste to be discharged into a tributary of Abram Flash. The prosecution at Wigan Magistrates Court was brought by the National Rivers Authority. A campaign has started to try to save one of the oldest street markets in Manchester. Traders at Greymare Lane in the Bradford district of the city want to keep it open, despite plans for a major road improvement scheme. Trevor Green has been visiting the stalls. Street markets can be great fun. This one in Manchester could be a bear market or an ostrich market. But whatever you're after, you're likely to get it at a rock-bottom price here in Greymare Lane. Bargain hunters come from near and far. People on a low income come to this market because it's about the cheapest throughout the country. The street market's been running since the 30s. Years ago, it looked like this. Then in 1970, Manchester City Council built its own market right next door. We feel that uh, they there, probably eh? want a monopoly position. And they feel that we're in the way with our cheap rents and uh, cheap overheads and... Uh, they don't like that. This is a special one for many people, you know, very nice. It can pick up anything or good things, you know, reasonable. Under a 19th century charter, Manchester City Council has the sole right to operate such markets within the city. And Mr Don's market happens to be in the way of a major improvement scheme. Mr Don suspects other motives. Manchester's adjoining market doesn't appear to be as busy. Manchester City Council says had it wanted to do so, it could have closed Mr Don's operation many years ago. But it needs to redevelop the entire area and must compulsorily purchase the land. Leslie Don has tried to barter with the council, but it's no deal. A public inquiry will be asked to determine the fate of the market next month. Walkers are to be banned from 80 square miles of the Peak District National Park because of the high risk of grass fires. The prohibited area is around Kinder Scout and Bleaklow, hundreds of acres of which were ablaze recently. The ban doesn't affect the Pennine Way, but walkers are still being asked to stay away from the popular route. Park rangers describe the peak moorland as tinder dry. That's all from us for now. Granada News is back at 5 to 10 tomorrow morning.
After some thundery outbreaks during the evening, by the early hours of the morning, further thundery rain may reach the south of the region. It'll be a warm and muggy night with minimum temperatures around 17 degrees. Tuesday will start bright and muggy with thundery showers in some areas and the showers will tend to become more widespread as the morning wears on. The afternoon will bring further thundery showers with some locally heavy downpours at times and it'll be another humid day with temperatures around 24 degrees. Wednesday will continue the warm weather but will be cloudy with showers at times. Thursday will be a brighter day but with some showers and Friday looks like being a mainly dry and sunny day while Saturday will start dry but will cloud over with rain later.